some people have seen where God has brought you from. They don't really understand it. They don't know your story. And welcome to You Don't Know My Story, a monthly television show where my guest comes on and they talk about their good, their bad, their ins and their outs. Uh, as you know, I always start my show off with my monologue, and we're still talking about this pandemic. And it's running rampant again. A lot of people still don't quite understand what this uh, virus is totally about. They don't believe it, they don't understand it, and they just won't do the right thing. In order for us to get a better grip of this virus, people have to understand that God works in mysterious ways. His ways is not our ways. You know, they, they, they uh, make a complaint about how fast this vaccine, uh, vaccination has came. There's a reason why. There's a reason why it, it's being done the way it's being done. People just have to be, get a better grip. Uh, the second virus is really going rampant. I uh, heard on a newscast how it's hitting all 50 states. And what it's doing now is it's affecting the people that are uh, vaccinated. But the thing about it, what they're saying is it's not affecting us the way it did in the beginning. You know, um, people that have been vaccinated are not dying from it the way they were in the beginning. So now it's hitting the ones that are not vaccinated. And I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. If your doctor said it's okay, get vaccinated. And, you know, protect your family, your friends, and yourself. We don't know who has what. We don't know who's being honest about this thing, you know, who's telling the truth. But all I'm saying is for your own protection, for you, get vaccinated if you're not vaccinated. Now also, if you notice, well, not notice, but last couple of days, they, they've been doing some crazy, crazy things in this world. Now they had this shootout outside the uh, baseball park the other day, you know, and can you imagine 30,000 people in a ballpark and they hear these gunshots and they start stampeding. People that um, stampede are the ones that are really going to hurt the people that you know, or bystanders. So we have to be very, very careful when we hear these gunshots. I mean, hey, look, I understand. If I'm somewhere and I hear gunshots, I'm getting out of there too. But just be careful, you know, who you might run over. You gotta remember, there's kids at these ballparks and these kids not, might not be able to move fast as the adults. So just be aware of your surroundings, uh, be aware of what's going on and just be very, very careful. And with that, we'll be right back. I'm back. <laughs> We're back. I have a young lady here today that's on my show to tell her story. Her name is uh, Nadja, and she's a beautiful young lady. So without any further ado, I want her to tell her story in her way. Nadja, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share my experience as well as my testimony, if I can say testimony. Yes, you can say it. Yes. So, so um, I am not original Daytonia. I'm mm. from Birmingham, Alabama. Born and raised, I'm a Southern girl, so you know Southern people know how to cook, so uh -oh, I do know how to cook. Don't talk about no food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I'm a mother of eight children. Um, Three of them are biological, and five of them I've adopted or uh, uh, helped raised. I attended Pennsylvania Valley High School. I'm a, I have a siblings, and I have a twin sister. And I'm so proud of my family and the support they have given me through the years. Mm -hmm. uh, when coming up through high school, you know, you always have bullying been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. They didn't just start bullying been around a long time. and. Down south, if you were dark skinned, it you really got picked on. Mm. So by me being dark skinned and being picked on all the time, I always walked down with my head hung down. I never raised it up, never looked up. 
and I never felt good about myself. I wasn't comfortable in my own skin because I was dark skinned, because you got picked on. I fought all the time through school because I was getting picked on because I was dark. Mm -hmm. So you, with that being said, you, walk, you wrestle with low self-esteem. Yes. You start thinking that you're not pretty enough or ugly enough. And then through life, I start saying, wait a minute, I ain't the ugliest person in the world and I ain't mm -hmm. the, the prettiest one either, but I'm what God has made me to be. Mm -hmm. So, but I didn't get comfortable with that until I hit 50. Mm -hmm. uh, at all that time. So I learned how to start raising up my head. So I uh, ended up coming to Ohio because my twin sister was here and she, be, uh, she became ill and I came up to help her, so I stayed. Mm -hmm. And I've been here ever since. So um, I have a set of identical twins mm. as well as uh, having a twin sister. Okay. Then I have twin nieces. Okay. So we're a family of twins. So I'm grateful for where I come from. My mother died when I was young. Mm. So. Uh, we was in up being orphans at 10, I believe it is, 10 or 12, that I was raised without a mother. So then going through, diff staying with my sister, then staying with my auntie, then being going into a, um, a group home. Back then they didn't call them group home, they called it something else. So then uh, we coming up to now, and up to now, uh, I went on to college, got my college degree, and from that, I decided, what is I'm going to do? What is it? What is my purpose? We are all born for a purpose. So what is my purpose? Mm -hmm. So I decided that I would go ask my pastor at that time, since we moved in this community, what can it is that we can do? Mm -hmm. And that's when she said, if you think your program, you think you have one, start it. So I did it. I started Helping Hands Community Outreach, uh, where we started off as a food pantry. Mm -hmm. Then it grew from uh, when the foreclosure pandemic hit, uh, we started working with people on first uh, foreclosure. So uh, that nonprofit stayed around until I became ill. Uh, I had a, a, a very good supportive staff. And from that, um, that started me on the quest of my purpose. Mm -hmm. And that was just in heaven. I want to stop you there for a second. Okay. Okay. I always want people to, to tell their beginnings. Okay. Um, who was the little girl? Oh. Uh, you know, you said you grew up in Alabama. I, I want to know who that little girl was growing up in Alabama. You know, the different little things, you know, that you went through as far as, you know, your, your, your schooling, your, your, your oh, okay. playing with, you know, because all this stuff that we're getting, you're getting ready to get into, we be done into your story before we got to got to the meat of your story. Okay. So let's let's let's, let's go, go back. let's go go back and let's begin with the little Nadja. Okay. Well, this little girl came up out of out of the airport in the south because you know the south has red dirt. Mm -hmm. So you know it's not dark like up here. So we played on we made our our own vehicles because when you coming up in the south during that time you was poor that's when the outhouses and stuff mm -hmm. and we couldn't afford dolls so we used to take the <laughs> the mm -hmm. hair out the cornstalk mm -hmm. and put it in coca-cola bottles and okay. make us dolls to play with okay. so that's what we did to entertain ourselves to have dolls and then we would take and make wagons uh, you take a two by four and you put wheels on it, and then we'll ride down the hill and um, by me having a twin, you know, twin mice, they mostly fight each other all the right. time. Because, mm -hmm. uh, number one, you competing against each other. Right. So, uh, so then having all these siblings, and I was always somewhere starting fights. Okay. I was the fightingest child you ever want to lay eyes on. <laughs> I was always fighting. And then, so my mama always said, if one person hits you, all of you fight. Mm. So therefore, if you hit one of us, all of a sudden you just saw me and my twin. It's then you know you got all these other ones, all these other siblings coming right, too. Right. So you had five kids beating up one person, and I only had one brother, and he would just stand back to make sure there's no boys and nothing get involved. Okay. So uh, from there, I, uh, I attended Keatonia Elementary School, and this is during the time when segregation started. Right. That okay. uh, we were being segregated, and we ended up having to go to an all-white school, mm -hmm. which was a good experience. 
uh, they didn't want black people coming to their school. Right. So before you can get out the bus, if they weren't spinning on you, they were throwing eggs on you. Mm. But after a while, he ended up settling down, so I graduated from Pinson Valley. Uh, I met my first boyfriend, who I was oh, crazy oh, about, <laughs> which was the, uh, he was a basketball player, and I was crazy about him. And um, so we dated all the way through high school, even dated out the high school. Mm -hmm. It just didn't work out as far as marriage go, but I was crazy about him. Right. But at that time, I didn't understand what love was. Right. So uh, you can't love nobody if you first don't know how to love yourself. Okay, so uh, by me still wrestling with that self-esteem that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, he was good looking. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, what is this good looking boy Mm -hmm. really want with this little girl that they call homely looking. Mm. Uh, so, because I was like 90 pounds, soaking wet, mm -hmm. and, they, and his mother go, she's nice, but she awfully homely looking. <laughs> so, <laughs> that didn't help my self-esteem right. neither, but here I was, and then at 23, I was pregnant with my first son, mm -hmm. and he named him uh, Maricus, which has been a light of my life. He's a, he's, a well, he's a very good young man. I'm thankful for him, and I'm thankful for those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, we would play, uh, never hopscotch, because I wasn't a good, I couldn't play hopscotch. Mm -hmm. uh, jump rope, you know, some little girls like to turn flips. Mm -hmm. I never turned a flip a day in my life. <laughs> I wouldn't do it, because I was scared I was going to break my arm. Right. Mm -hmm. I said, here I am skinny. One thing I want, don't want to be, I don't want to be deformed. Mm -hmm. So I ain't turning no flip, because I ain't breaking my arm. So, uh, but that was basically my childhood, and then... Uh, well, 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 let me ask you. Now, uh, you did say in the beginning that your mother had passed early. Mm -hmm. Now, did you get an opportunity to, you know, be able to spend time with your mom? And, you know, what, what kind of relationship did you have with your mother? Uh, and your father, if you had, what you know. I had a father. I was crazy about my father. I, I love my father very much. Uh, my mother was very stern, mm -hmm. and as a child, uh, I just thought she was abusive. Mm -hmm. uh, we got whipped with anything she put her, got her hands on, whether it was a stenching card, a broom, whatever. Oh, I remember that. Uh, wherever she got her hands on, that's mm -hmm. what she beat you with. Right. So I was always somewhere getting whipped because I had too much mouth. Okay. And she would come, she would say, come here, you always, and she would always smack me in my mouth. So here I am, dark-skinned had to go to school with swollen lips. Mm. Not only with swollen lips, but with bruises. Right. And back then, they didn't call children service or anybody when you beat the crap out of your kids. Right. That was just a norm back mm -hmm. then. So that didn't help me none either, because I'm at school trying to keep my hands over my mouth because she hit me in the mouth. Right. I can recall one day I was standing outside on the bus stop playing with an orange, mm -hmm. and I'm just throwing the orange up, just waiting for the bus. She called me, and as I crossed the street to go see what she want, she whipped me right outside in front of everybody mm. and told me, black girl, food ain't to be played with, it's to eat. Mm. And to this very day, I still, when I put an orange in my hand, I still throw it up in the air. Mm -hmm. And I often think, I say, if she was alive, she would go, you still playing with food? Because <laughs> that, that was something that I did. Right. And she would go, uh, and I was upset that she divorced my father. Yeah. And I wanted to go with him, but she wouldn't allow me to. Uh, and she whipped me because I said, why are you divorcing my dad? Mm -hmm. And I'm going, why are you whip a child? Because she asked you a question, why you? Yeah, yeah. Why are you why are you leaving my dad? So I didn't I couldn't understand Olivia for nothing in the world. And for years I did not like my mother. Mm. I'm just now getting to the place where I will allow somebody to talk to her about to me about her. Because mm. before I wouldn't let you say anything to me about her. I didn't want to know nothing about her. Mm -hmm. Even though she was dead and gone. I hated her. Yeah. And I'm going, hate is such a strong word, but I really disliked her. Right. Because I couldn't understand her method. Right. But now that I'm older and I didn't raise kids, I can understand. Mm -hmm. The sad part is. I turned out just like her. <laughs> Don't we? Yeah. Um, 
You know, because your story that you're saying, and, and, and what you're saying about your mother, I'm going through that today. Oh, wow. I'm going yeah. through the exact same thing. Me and my mother has not spoke now. I'll say it's going on six months. And it's been, we, we were at times where it was longer than that. And it was due to the fact that uh, my mother was a very stern mother. Uh, she would beat us with iron cords and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Like you said, back in the day, uh, it wasn't called child abuse. You know, we didn't call it child abuse. Right. It was called a whooping. Yeah. And, you know, today it's called child abuse. You hit right. a child with an iron cord. That's just, the, that's just like getting beat uh, by some of the slave masters with those whips. Mm -hmm. They didn't use iron cords, but that's the same it's thing. The same thing, yes. And so I understand exactly what you're saying because I had to come to grips with using the terminology of hate. You know, hate my mother. You yes. know, uh, I don't hate my mother. I love my mother. But the thing about it is, we just don't get along. Yeah. See, I was my mother's birthday baby. Okay. I was born October the first. Her birthday is October the second. Okay. We just alike. But wow. she always try to say I was more like my father than I was like her. I look more like him than her. Okay. But everybody to this day would tell you that we look exactly alike. <laughs> okay. My mother had me when she was 15. Wow. You okay. know, so she had me at a very young age. You know, and, and my other siblings, uh, my, I have a brother. Well, he's passed now. He got uh, shot and killed about 35, 40 years ago. Okay. I have a sister uh, that thinks she's everybody's mother. Yes. <laughs> um, then my mother remarried. I have uh, two sisters and a brother by her second marriage. Her husband was more like a father, really, to me than my father. My father was a professional fighter, so okay. he traveled a lot. Plus, he was a womanizer. Okay. Uh, you know, he loved women. Okay. And the early part of my growing up, you know, my teenage going into my adulthood, I was exactly the same way he was. A lot of things about her, I, I had the same ways, you know. But for some strange reason, we just don't, I, I mean, I've tried. I'm gonna be honest with you. I prayed on it. I asked God to open up doors. I thought maybe it was me, you know. A lot of times it probably was me because I'm the type of person I, I don't like a lot of nonsense. I don't like a lot of arguing. I don't like a lot of fighting. I don't like none of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm a very sensitive man okay. today. Okay. I mean, I did a dedication over the weekend and, and boo-hooed my behind off. Okay. But that's just me. Okay. You know, I, I'm very, very sensitive. You know, I'm easy to be hurt. But I tell you like this, you mess with the wrong one. That was all the ones. You mess with the wrong one mm -hmm. because I'm like this. Um, I will do anything for you that I can. But when you cross me, you got the worst person in the world. I'm not going to do anything to you. All I got to do is look at you. And that's enough right there to tell you I ain't going to be bothered with you, you know. But I'm just so glad that you brought that story up about what you said about your mom. Yeah. Because uh, I, I know exactly what you went through. Because, like I said, mine is still living, and I wish we had a better relation. Yes. You know, I am the oldest in my family, you know. Okay. And I, I wish it could be a lot better than what it is. But it is what it is. And yes. I'm going to love I can, I, you know, I, I love it from a distance. Yes. You know, that's the best that I could do. Um, your relationship with your father, did you have any kind of relationship? Yes. Um Yes, I was his little black gal. That's what they <laughs> call me, black gal. Uh -huh. uh, I was his little black gal. Um, when they got divorced, he moved here to Ohio. Okay. So um, I, I didn't get a chance to see him again until after I moved here. Mm -hmm. That's when I got a chance to try to spend some time with him then, but he was married to somebody that didn't want his kids coming around. Mm. So that's another story by itself. But. Uh, I tried to live the best way I can to try to handle my childhood. And then when I would look at the bruises and stuff from all the beatings, uh, 
because I would run away. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that part. Okay. I hated whoopings. Okay. I couldn't stand it. So I would run away. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sleep in the woods all night. Didn't care. So this one time she wanted to whip me, she took off all my clothes. So mm -hmm. I ran away butt naked. Mm -hmm. And um, it was getting cold. So we we live not too far from the old Indian reservation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I covered myself up in leaves to sleep there all night. And I stayed gone for two days like that. Mm. And finally, I had to go back home because I had nowhere else to go. Plus, I had no clothes on. Mm. Mm. So, uh, and on my way back home, <laughs> the neighbor had washed her uh, clothes. Because back then, you know, you didn't you didn't have uh, washers and dryers. Right. So mm. you had that little old washing machine where you <laughs> ran the clothes through. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I saw. She had hung her sheets out on line, so I grabbed the sheet off the line to wrap myself up in. Mm -hmm. And finally, I went on home. I still got a beating, but um, I hated my childhood. Mm. I despised it. I hated every part of it. I hated it so much so when I started having children, my children don't even know me. Mm. And that's a shame to say because I never talked about my childhood, where I came from. Mm -hmm how I dealt with anything because I wanted to close all that part of me up. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time sitting and I was, I just hated myself so bad. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, I don't, I don't understand why I was raised up in that type of environment, but we were. And um, my siblings, they got over it quicker than I did, but I, I didn't, I, I walked around with that hatred feeling in her for the longest. Mm -hmm. And I remember that when she died, in the front yard we had a dogwood tree. And me and my sister got around the dogwood tree and started singing the old Wicked Witch is Dead. <laughs> and I'm going, when I look back on those years and I'm going, forgive me for my thoughts. Right. I'm going, but how does a child feel that way about their mother? But I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, as I look at myself in the mirror now, I look like her. Right. And I'm going, is that why she was always beating me? Mm. I, everybody got whoopings, but mm. it looked like I got it the worst. Yeah. And then I, I, I just didn't understand it. So I made it through childhood okay. uh, with a lot of bitter tears. I can talk about it today uh, without crying. It's because... That goes into another story, but I can talk about it today without crying. But before then, I couldn't talk about it mm. because every child, especially a girl, wants the love of their mother. And I was sharing with my sister that I didn't know what love was because mm. to me, love was beating the crap out of somebody. But um, but I wasn't there gonna let no man put his hands on me. We and we weren't gonna even play that game. That we weren't, that <laughs> wasn't even that wasn't even a thought. <laughs> but um, cause I'm going, I was beat as a child, and ain't no way I'm gonna get in an abusive relationship with anybody. Right. Even though that I wrestled with that inner part of me that felt like that I was born to suffer. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand. I really couldn't understand. I'm just put it away. I couldn't understand. But then going through high school, I did get a chance to go to the prom. Me and my, uh, like I told you about the basketball player who I was crazy with, mm -hmm. we broke up. So he asked his other twin at school to go with him who was yellow. Mm. So I decided, okay, you're going to go get a yellow girl to go take you to, to the prom. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go find me a yellow man, <laughs> a yellow boy, to come take, to go take me to the prom. <laughs> so I shows up at the prom with this yellow, good-looking man <laughs> on my <laughs> He looking at me, uh -huh. and I'm looking at him. <laughs> so the girl that he brought got upset because uh -huh. he couldn't stop looking at me, uh -huh. and I couldn't stop looking at him. Well, the guy that I brought with me didn't care. Because uh, he was just knowing, he was just escorting me. Right. <laughs> he said, you know what, I didn't get a chance to go to my high school prom, so I'd be glad to take you. Right. So the only thing that he can say about him was, 
he got on brown shoes with a blue suit. Because <laughs> when he showed up, I looked down at his feet and going, where are your black shoes? He said, I loaned them out and they didn't bring them back in time, so forgive me. And I'm going, but that's the only criticism that you can think of. So at the end of the prom, I ditched him. He ditched her, and we all went to a party together. All right. I'm going, we had, we had a crazy relationship. Wow, that was a crazy wow. relationship, but. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a uh, quick little pause for the cause. Okay. So you can get yourself together, and we're going to go into the second phase okay. of your life. Okay. Um, just before we go to the ending of your story. So we're going to take a quick pause, and we'll be right back. Thank you. Oh, we're back. So we're going to get into the second half of Ms. Glassboro's story. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to say anymore. I'm going to let her go into the second half of her story. Well, thank you so much again. Um, the second half of my story is that um, at 25, I believe it was, that I got married. Mm -hmm. I married an older gentleman. Mm -hmm. He was uh, 25 years older than I was. I wanted somebody that I thought that was more stable than I was, okay. that can help rise me up out of poverty. Okay. Uh, I didn't marry for love, I was marrying for convenience sake. Uh, that's before I talk about that marriage, just talk about me getting pregnant with my twins. Okay. Uh, uh, he, he was a very good looking man. But he was yet shy okay. and very bashful. So uh, I was a fighter, mm -hmm. and I didn't have a problem speaking my mind or speaking my peace. Uh, but we broke up, and he married a woman <laughs> right across the street from me. Mm -hmm. Well, I can look in her door, and she can look in mine. Mm -hmm. And here I was with a big old belly. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine somebody marrying on you while you pregnant mm. and then marry right across the street from you at the same time? Wow. So when I used to get out my house to go to get in my car, she stayed here and her mother stayed here. Mm. So I would get it from her and I would get it from her mother. I was all kind of the black ugly so and so's. Mm. And I'm going, I ain't do nothing to y'all. She got the man, so why she bothering me? <laughs> But anyway, so that was that process. So after I had the twin, that's when I married the older gentleman mm -hmm. because I wanted to come out, out of low-income housing because right. uh, they was there, the mama was there, and here I was stuck in the middle. Mm. And I'm gone. You know, I'm catacombing between these two. So he would hit my way out. So he took me and moved me to a house, and then I moved from there and moved to New Jersey. Uh, me and my babies, all three of them, moved to New Jersey. There I got an opportunity to meet Sissy Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended church with her, got a chance to, uh, to get to know her. So that was a good experience. Uh, my husband became a pastor of this prestigious church, so I had to learn how to become a first lady. Mm. So that was an interesting experience. Uh, eventually I got homesick and I wanted my twin, so I came back to Ohio. I left him because uh, he would drink on Sunday, on Saturdays and go preach on Sunday mornings. <laughs> and I was sitting right at sermons. Right. And um, then he'll get up there and he'll cry because he can sing. And he'll cry, then when he'll get, he'll go, Mama, how I do? I said, you didn't want to ask me how you did. Mm -hmm. You played with the devil all night on Saturday and want to get up on Sunday morning and preach to somebody, then get the nerves up there and cry. I mm -hmm. said, man, go sit down somewhere. <laughs> so um, I left him and came back and I divorced. So here I was trying to figure out which direction I wanted to go in my life now, because mm -hmm. here I am now, married, divorced, three babies to take care of. Not only did I come back with three babies, I came back with extra baby because mm. I took in this other little baby. Mm -hmm. uh, his mama was uh, dealing drugs and thought she had that type of lifestyle she wanted to live. So I went to court. Now, let's talk about this court experience. Okay. We in court, and she called me all kind of ugly black bees and all this kind. 
Mm -hmm. That go the judge sitting there. Mm -hmm. Here go my my lawyer. That go her lawyer. That she go. That go the social work. Mm -hmm. So while she sitting up there calling me all kind of black so and sos, I say I ain't gonna be no more your black so and so. So when she said, "What you gonna do about it, B?" I forgot that I was sitting in front of the judge. I reached across the lawyers mm. and pulled her to me. Wow. And got the fighting in the court. Right. So I'm going, God will deliver you. So from that experience, the judge said, uh, we're gonna halt it. I need Nedra to go see a psychologist <laughs> to make sure that she don't have violent tendencies. Right. So when you go see the psychology, they put all these little pictures up from you, these little picture marks. Mm -hmm. And I said, you can keep showing me all them pictures you want. I'm not going to say anything bad about them. I said, because even though I did not care for my mother, my mother taught me, you still find the good in the bad. Mm -hmm. So you can stop asking me that. I said, the only reason that I got to fighting in the court because I have fed her and I'm taking care of her baby and she won't sit up in front of these people and disrespect me. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't having it. So I said, so if children's service want to place the baby somewhere else, so be it. Okay. And that's how I took it. But nevertheless, the judge still gave me the baby. Mm -hmm. So I came back with a fourth baby back to Ohio. Uh, he's grown now. So then let's talk about moving forward. I went on back to college. I went to college with my children. We were all sitting around at the dinner table after we ate dinner, because uh, my kids didn't know what McDonald's was. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what that was. If they got a chance to go to McDonald's, that was a treat, because I cook home-cooked meals every day, because they were so skinny. Mm -hmm. So um, when they sat down and did homework, I sat down with them, and I did my homework with them and I graduated from Sinclair with a social and liberal arts and science. Mm -hmm. uh, a mother of four children. And I tell any single mother who say they can't go to school and raise kids. Yes, you can. Because I didn't talk about it. I didn't have a car when I had to take them twins and put them in the same little pumpkin seat mm -hmm. and get on the bus and hold the other two-year-old by the hand to get on the bus. So I managed to do that because I had to do what I needed to do in order to survive. So let's move up to the day. It's where I end up going to Church of the Good Shepherd, and I was sitting in the back part of the church and just observe it. Because um, a friend of mine named Frenchie said, come go to church with me. And I said, we ain't going to go to one of the church where they beat the drums and talking that old funny language. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, I'm going, I don't know about going to one of them churches. Mm -hmm. So I sat out in the car because he said, I'm going to go to prayer. So I sat out in the car, so it took him too long. Mm -hmm. So I went up to go to the door to ask him, what's taking you so long? Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in the back, and I'm just observing. So I liked it, so I went back. Mm -hmm. So one day, I was no longer sitting on the back part of the pew. I was in front of the front part of the pew. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, I was one of them tongue-talking, funny language-talking people, too. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, wow, that was an interesting experience, and I, I wouldn't take nothing for that journey and nothing for her being my pastor because she said, let me teach you that whatever you think, you don't have to speak it. Mm -hmm. She, you said, you mind me so much of my daughter, because wherever she says, she feel like she got to speak it, and right. that's you. So you don't have to speak everything that comes to mind. So, she Well, what I'm going to do, and I don't mean to interrupt that's you. That's fine. I have a, a, the young lady that's going to uh, perform for us later. She's an evangelist. Okay. And uh, her show is called Real Talk with Tina Mobley. And I believe what you're talking about now you would suit her show perfectly. Thank you. My show is more secondary. Okay. Okay. So I try not to, I, I try not to get too far into the religious aspect. I got you. I mean, I'm a, I'm a minister myself. I got you. I don't try to carry on into my show. But what we're going to do is... Um... Hi, I'm Katie Carey, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach for Clothes at Work, located at the Job Center. Our mission for over 20 years has been to clothe, educate, and empower individuals to prepare them for employment success. 
Close at Work is well known in the Dayton region for providing interview and workplace appropriate attire for local job seekers. Savvy shoppers know us for our fabulous boutique, featuring gently used upscale clothing at great prices. The best part about our boutique is that every dollar spent goes directly back into our programs and services. However, one thing you may not know about Close at Work is that we have an amazing workforce development education program. The Workplace Institute was launched in February 2017 when area employers expressed difficulty finding job applicants with necessary job readiness behaviors and soft skills to be successful on the job. A team of professionals from our community representing every industry came together with us and combined their experience in workforce development and education to help us create our research-based curriculum. Each workshop is skillfully designed to engage participants in group discussions, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and fun hands-on activities to help build confidence and professional demeanor. Workshop topics include making a positive first impression, proper professional attire, effective communication techniques, on-the-job conflict resolution skills, and how to build professional relationships. Through our education program, we have provided more than 150 workshops to over 1,500 individuals in just two and a half years, and our numbers continue to grow. It's no surprise that developing a healthy workforce needs to start at an early age for the health of our local economy. Out of this need, our workshops have been invited into high school classrooms all across the Miami Valley. In fact, 75% of our workshop participants are high school students, and we have presented workshops to students from over 33 area high schools. Close at Work is excited to present workshops this fall with area college programs, including Sinclair College and in partnership with Fifth Third Bank at Central State University. For more information about our Workforce Development Education Program or any of our programs and services, please visit our website at www.closethatwork.com. Org. The young lady. Okay, my name is Nalja Grasper, and I'm so happy to be here to share my story, my upbringing, and where I am today. And where I am today is that I want to share on your platform, if I may, the importance of why having health insurance is important. Okay. In 2015, I started start being sick all the time. I would have the symptoms like I had the flu. And they kept telling me there was nothing wrong with me. And I kept saying, something is wrong with me. And I said, would y'all please do some blood work, because something is wrong with me. And they told me no. So one particular day, uh, December the 21st, uh, I'll never forget it, because that's my twin's birthday. I went to the store, and because I, I was Christmas shopping, and I just felt so tired. And I asked my sister, I said, can you come get Javel and keep it for me for a while? I really don't feel good. So uh, I went to the doctor and he told me, well, you're probably coming down with strep. Go to the store and get something to gargle with. Mm -hmm. And uh, you probably uh, have strep throat. So with that being said, I said, I'm not going to go waste no money on getting none of the throat throat. I'm going to go home and do it the old fashioned way. Well, I, I went home and I laid down, and that morning when I woke up, I was feeling worse than I was before I went to the doctor. So uh, I called my son and asked him, was he working out in the field today? And he said, yes. I said, I need to go to the emergency room because something is seriously wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, so I called my sister. She said, no, they said nothing is wrong with you. I said, I'm telling you, something is wrong with me. So I said, I'm going to take a shower and I'm going to lay down. So when I got ready to lay down, this small, still voice said, no, don't lay down. So you need to go to the emergency room. So I went on ahead and went to the emergency room. And when I got there, I said, I just don't feel good. Something is wrong with me. Mm -hmm. So the lady took my blood pressure and she said it was 70 over 40. Mm. And uh, she came back again and took it. And I said, what seemed, the problem? what seemed to be the problem? She said, oh, you're dying. Mm. I'm going, ooh, that was cold. <laughs> so next thing I know, I got all these doctors in the room. So then the head physician, who's my doctor, was in the emergency room. So I'm going, why are you here? Because you know your main physician don't come to the emergency room. You don't see them. Right. And I'm going, so something serious must be wrong. They said, we can ready to move you up to ICU. I said, why? He said, we don't know what's wrong with you, but something wrong with you. How long your legs been red? 
I said, my leg can't be red. I'm too dark to be red. So I looked down and my leg was jet red. Mm. Uh, so that this time, uh, the young lady that took me, she started calling my children and said, y'all need to get to the hospital. They're willing your mother to ICU. Uh, that's the last thing I remember. Mm. So I woke up from a coma. It was January when I woke up from the coma. My birthday had passed. Now we're into January uh, 2016. And um, they had me on a ventilator. So I couldn't talk because of the ventilator. So I had to write everything down. So the doctor came in and kept asking me, was I a celebrity? And I'm mm. going, he said, are you famous? I'm going, he said, well, who is all these people then? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, I don't know. So uh, he told me they cut off my leg. Mm. So I said, why did y'all cut off my leg? Mm -hmm. I'm not a diabetic. Mm -hmm. So what's the purpose of y'all cutting off my leg? And they said you had a, a, a bacteria called necrotizer physitis, mm -hmm. which all in, all in one out of five survive it, if you get it. Uh, so they told my family that, I'm only going by what they said because I was in a coma, that I only had a 5% chance of living. Mm -hmm. And then if I lived, <laughs> I would be in the hospital for a year mm -hmm. and I would be on dialysis for a year. Mm -hmm. Not only was that uh, I lose my leg, all my organs shut down, hmm. so they gave me up for dead. But all my organs came all back up at once by themselves. So next time I died out on them, I bled out and needed 20 pints of blood. Hmm. And I'm going, wow, can you imagine going to the hospital saying you don't feel good and waking up and find out that you went in with two legs, mm. but you're gonna be wheeled out with one. <laughs> so, and because of my, I shared my childhood and, and the self-esteem issues that I went through, I had to try to deal with the loss of my leg. Mm. But thanks to what they, it's American um, Care Act, but they also call it the Obamacare, and nowadays some of them call them the Biden Cares. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> if I hadn't applied for ACA, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had no insurance. Right. So, uh, and because of that, I had the good care. And my son ended up saying, what can I do to increase her policy to make sure that she had the best insurance mm -hmm. so I can have the best care that was. So I did receive the best care that was. So when I came out to coma, and I'm going to go to this, they asked me, did you see any bright lights? I said, I ain't seen no bright lights. I ain't seen nothing. Mm. But I said, but God says storms was coming. Mm. So I kept going, what I supposed to do with that information? I didn't know what to do with it. Right. So with that being said, Helping Hands Community Outreach ended up taking a hit because I was no longer there to Keep it going, right? Because Helping Hands is a nonprofit, and you know nonprofits rely totally on nothing but grants. Mm -hmm. So there was not only that I have my bills at my personal life, but I also had bills on the nonprofit side. Mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't close the doors. Uh, I had a staff member kept it kept it going. So uh, we changed the name. So it's now, it's a rising community outreach. It's where they're doing navigator services. Mm -hmm. So if you need health care insurance and low income, they now have plans now that you can get it for at least $10 a month to get basic care. Please let me stress this on your show. Go ahead. Many people are dying today because they will not go and get checkups. Once you hit past 40, Mm -hmm. You need to go to the doctor. You can believe in God. You can believe in Jesus. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But go to the doctor and get checked to make sure that you are healthy. Mm -hmm. That way that women don't have to lose their breasts. Men don't have to keep dying for prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. I lost people to both. And now with this COVID virus still picking up, you need to have some health care insurance. And you can call one of the navigators at Arising Community at 937-259-8870. And one of them will be able to talk with you and talk about what plans that are available based on 
how much income that you have. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you have no income, there's still a plan for ten dollars a month. Some people smoke up ten dollars. Mm -hmm. Some people drink up ten dollars. Mm -hmm. So some people junk up ten dollars. So mm -hmm. get some health care insurance. It's just as important as having life, car, and house. Okay. They're just important. Well, I want to thank you so very much for coming on and telling your story. It's a pleasure. I mean, I really, really enjoyed everything that you were saying. And with your Horizon Community Development, uh, I pray that everything will go well with that. I pray that you stay healthy. Keep thank you. yourself fit. Be aware of your surroundings. And just be careful because, you know, we up in the age now, we... We got we got we we got to be very careful about who we around. Amen. So, but yes. I just want to say thank you so thank very you. much. Uh, we're going to take a, a second. When we come back, we will have the lovely Miss Tina Mobley, who will close out the show. Once again, the Marvin Sapp video. We don't own the rights to the video. We don't own the rights to the song. It was for entertainment purpose only. We wanted to show it just to say thank you for all the things that's been going on in our lives. So with that, we'll be right back. Well, welcome back. Well, now we come to the part of the show that everybody seems to love. My girl Tina Mobley is here, and she is going to end the program with one of her very, very um, well-performed renditions of she'll tell you what it is <laughs> so take it away Miss Tina Mobley
Okay, well, thank you so much, Miss Tina Moby. <laughs> Miss Tina Moby, thank you so very, very much. And you look very nice in this red. Well, thank you. It fits you perfectly. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, Nadja, come on over. It's Nelja, come on over, Nelja. <laughs> come right about here. First of all, I want to thank you for coming on and thank telling you. your story. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure your story is going to touch a lot of souls and a lot of hearts. Thank you. And I really, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. I want you to go on her show, Real Talk with Tina Mobley. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm sure she's the type of person she will uh, read your books, and she will have a story to tell. Lord have mercy. I can cut that. <laughs> and she's a praiser, so we can praise him together. That's what I'm talking about, and I'm sure y'all will. So I want to thank both of you, Tina, for coming and doing what you do. And you, Miss Young Lady, may God bless you and continue to uh, work with you and do the things that you need. And I hope your uh, program will be a successful program. Thank you. So I want to say thank you and God bless. God bless. Remember, Sundays, 4 p.m. on Spectrum Television, Channel 5, 6, or 23. Um, Thursday morning, 11, 10, uh, 10 p.m. on Spectrum Television. You don't know my story. And look out for my podcast, Make a Star Productions. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.